Chapter 8, Part 2 I passed a night of unmingled wretchedness. In the morning I went to the court. My lips and throat were parched. I dared not ask the fatal question, but I was known, and the officer guessed the cause of my visit. The ballots had been thrown. They were all black, and Justine was condemned. I cannot pretend to describe what I then felt. I had before experienced sensations of horror, and I have endeavoured to bestow upon them adequate expressions, but words cannot convey an idea of the heart-sickening despair that I then endured. The person to whom I addressed myself added that Justine had already confessed her guilt. That evidence, he observed, was hardly required in so glaring a case, but I am glad of it, and indeed none of our judges like to condemn a criminal upon circumstantial evidence, be it ever so decisive. This was strange and unexpected intelligence. What could it mean? Had my eyes deceived me? And was I really as mad as the whole world would believe me to be if I disclosed the object of my suspicions? I hastened to return home, and Elizabeth eagerly demanded the results. My cousin, replied I, it is decided, as you may have expected, all judges had rather that ten innocent should suffer than that one guilty should escape. But she has confessed. This was a dire blow to poor Elizabeth, who had relied with firmness upon Justine's innocence. Alas, said she, how shall I ever again believe in human goodness? Justine, whom I loved and esteemed as my sister, how could she put on those smiles of innocence only to betray? Her mild eyes seemed incapable of any severity or guile, and yet she has committed a murder. Soon after, we heard that the poor victim had expressed a desire to see my cousin. My father wished her not to go, but said that he left it to her own judgment and feelings to decide. Yes, said Elizabeth, I will go. Although she is guilty and you, Victor, shall accompany me, I cannot go alone. The idea of this visit was torture to me, yet I could not refuse we entered the gloomy prison chamber and beheld Justine sitting on some straw at the farther end. Her hands were manacled and her head rested on her knees. She rose on seeing us enter, and when we were left alone with her, she threw herself at the feet of Elizabeth, weeping bitterly. My cousin wept also. Oh, Justine, said she, why did you rob me of my last consolation? I relied on your innocence, and although I was then very wretched, I was not so miserable as I am now. And do you also believe that I am so very, very wicked to you? Also join with my enemies to crush me, to condemn me as a murderer? Her voice was suffocated with sobs. Rise, my poor girl, said Elizabeth. Why do you kneel if you are innocent? I am not one of your enemies. I believed your guiltless, notwithstanding every evidence, until I heard that you had yourself declared your guilt. 
that report you say is false, and be assured, dear Justine, that nothing can shake my confidence in you for a moment but your own confession. I did confess, but I confessed a lie. I confessed that I might obtain absolution, but now that falsehood lies heavier at my heart than all my other sins. The God of heaven forgive me. Ever since I was condemned, my confessor has besieged me. He threatened and menaced until I almost began to think that I was the monster that he said I was. He threatened excommunication and hellfire in my last moments if I continued obdurate. Dear lady, I had none to support me. All looked on me as a wretch doomed to ignominy and perdition. What could I do? In an evil hour I subscribed to a lie, and now only am I truly miserable. She paused, weeping, and then continued. I thought with horror, my sweet lady, that you should believe your Justine, whom your blessed aunt had so highly honoured and whom you loved, was a creature capable of a crime which none but the devil himself could have perpetrated. Dear William, dearest blessed child, I soon shall see you again in heaven, where we shall all be happy, and that consoles me, going as I am to suffer ignominy and death. Oh, Justine, forgive me for having for one moment distrusted you. Why did you confess? But do not mourn, dear girl, do not fear. I will proclaim, I will prove your innocence. I will melt the stony hearts of your enemies by my tears and prayers. You shall not die. You, my playfellow, my companion, my sister, perish on the scaffold. No, no, I never could survive so horrible a misfortune. Justine shook her head mournfully. I do not fear to die, she said. That pang is past. God raises my weakness and gives me courage to endure the worst. I leave a sad and bitter world, and if you remember me and think of me as one of unjustly condemned, I am resigned to the fate awaiting me. Learn from me, dear lady, to submit in patience. To the will of heaven. During this conversation, I had retired to a corner of the prison room where I could conceal the horrid anguish that possessed me. Despair. Who dared talk of that? The poor victim who, on the morrow, was to pass the awful boundary between life and death, felt not as I did such deep and bitter agony. I gnashed my teeth and ground them together, uttering a groan that came from my inmost soul. Justine started. When she saw who it was, she approached me and said, Dear sir, you are very kind to visit me. You, I hope, do not believe that I am guilty. I could not answer. No, Justine, said Elizabeth. He is more convinced of your innocence than I was, for even when he heard that you had confessed, he did not credit it. I truly thank him. In these last moments I feel the sincerest gratitude towards those who think of me with kindness. How sweet is the affection of others to such a wretch as I am. It removes more than half my misfortune, and I feel as if I could die in peace now that my innocence is acknowledged by you, dear lady, and your cousin. Thus the poor sufferer tried to comfort others and herself. She indeed gained the resignation she desired, but I, the true murderer, felt the never-dying warm life in my bosom which allowed of no hope or consolation. Elizabeth also wept 
and was unhappy, but hers also was the misery of innocence, which, like a cloud that passes over the fair moon, for a while hides but cannot tarnish its brightness. Anguish and despair had penetrated into the core of my heart. I bore a hell within me which nothing could extinguish. We stayed several hours with Justine, and I was with great, and it was with great difficulty that Elizabeth could tear herself away. I wish, cried she, that I were to die with you. I cannot live in this world of misery. Justine assumed an air of cheerfulness while she with difficulty repressed her bitter tears. She embraced Elizabeth and said in a voice of half-suppressed emotion, Farewell, sweet lady, dearest Elizabeth, my beloved and only friend. May heaven in its bounty bless and preserve you. May this be the last misfortune that you will ever suffer. Live and be happy and make others so. And on the morrow... Justine died. Elizabeth's heart-rending eloquence failed to move the judges from their settled conviction in the criminality of the saintly sufferer. My passionate and indignant appeals were lost upon them, and when I received their cold answers, and heard the harsh, unfeeling reasoning of these men, my purposed avowal died away on my lips. Thus I might proclaim myself a madman, but not revoke the sentence passed upon my wretched victim. She perished on the scaffold as a murderess. From the tortures of my own heart I turned to contemplate the deep and voiceless grief of my Elizabeth. This also was my doing, and my father's woe, and the desolation of that late so smiling home, all was the work of my thrice accursed hands. Ye weep, unhappy ones, but these are not your last tears, Again shall you rise, the funeral wail, and the sound of your lamentations shall again and again be heard. Frankenstein, your son, your kinsman, your early, much-loved friend, he who would spend each vital drop of blood for your sakes, who has no thought nor sense of joy except as it is mirrored also in your dear countenances, who would fill the air with blessings and spend his life in serving you, he bids you weep and shed countless tears, happy beyond his hopes, if thus inexorable fate be satisfied. And if the destruction pause before the peace of the grave have succeeded to your sad torments. Thus spoke my prophetic soul, as torn by remorse, horror, and despair. I held those I loved spend vain sorrow upon the graves of William and Justine, the first hapless victims to my unhallowed arts. So that was chapter 8. Bye-bye. Till next time with chapter 9.